Hello everyone and welcome back to a new episode of 3DP. This will be episode 1 and this is going to be about 3D printers, what they are, where they came from, how they work, and also probably what's next in the field of 3D printing. So to start out I want to show you how, well the basics of how a 3D printer makes a 3D object. And the way it works is it uses, it just draws a path and stacks layers on top of each other. You can see there's the one Piece, there's the one plastic model that's silver and you can see highlighted are the layers that comprise the object and you can also see a red rabbit made out of felt and the layers you can see stacked on top of each other is very similar to how a 3D printer actually operates. So get that concept of layers in your head, think about it, it just has layers that have a finite thickness so that they just stack on top of each other and create a 3D object. So printer types, there are two main types nowadays for 3D printers that you'll be likely to see. There are of course more, but I'll get into those later. But there is FDM, which is Fused Deposition Modeling, and SLA, which is Stereolithography. Now FDM 3D printers are the most common and the cheapest type of 3D printer. It's the same type I have, it's what MakerBots use, it's what Ultimakers use, it's what the M3D uses. Most consumer 3D printers are FDM, and the way they work is they have plastic, plastic filament, that goes through a heated extruder and then out a nozzle. And the heated extruder is heated up normally around 200 degrees Celsius, which is like, uh, I don't really want to do the conversion right now, but like about 400 Fahrenheit. Eh. But that's how they work. They're essentially just computer-controlled hot glue guns. And stereolithography printers use resin in a bed, and they have lasers that are very precisely focused and manipulated in order to selectively cure areas within the pool of resin. It's similar to like, I'm not sure if you've been to the dentist and they've had that glue stuff that they put in your mouth and then they have that UV light thing with the orange mirror, or like the orange piece of glass to like shield them from it. It's similar to that, where the U ultraviolet radiation from the laser cures and hardens the resin into an object. But they all place down layers and make layers solid. So now that you know how 3D printers, like the basics of how they work, let's get into a little bit of the history of 3D printing. Now the earliest reference to like 3D printing technologies were called rapid prototyping. And the reason they were called rapid prototyping, abbreviated RP, is because it was thought that it would be a cost-effective way of making prototypes really quickly in industries around the country. And the first patent was filed by Dr. Kadama in 1980, but it actually wasn't filed within the one-year deadline after the application, so he never actually got the patent. It really started in 1986 with Charles Hull's patent for a stereolithography apparatus for rapid prototyping in 1986. He first actually invented the machine and created one of these in 1983, and he later co-founded 3D Systems Corporation, which is still a very large corporation today. And the first commercially available rapid prototyping system, obviously this thing would have been very, very expensive. It was introduced in 1987, and it was SLA-1 introduced by 3D Systems. But the first one sold in 1988 after much, much testing because these were very high precision devices. They had to work every time and they make sure to get all the bugs worked out. Meanwhile, Carl Deckert was working on a system that used selective laser sintering process. Now this is a different type of 3D printing thing. It uses lasers to basically selectively melt powdered metal, but it was issued in 1989 and then he also got that patent. And another guy, Scott Crump, co-founder of Stratasys filed a patent regarding an FDM process. Now FDM, you remember, was like hot glue. And that came in 1989 when he got the patent for that. EOS started selling their systems that used fused deposition modeling in 1990. And that was like very early stuff in the 3D printing industry. But some more recent stuff. The FDM patent was actually issued to Stratasys in 1992. And then a bit happened, but it's sort of like complicated and not too important. But in 2004, Dr. Bauer conceived of the RepRap project, which was an open source, community-oriented 
3D printing project where people would build their own 3D printers and try to get the cost down, but still have very good units. But later, three years later, in 2007, the first complete system was made for under $10,000 by 3D Systems, but it wasn't incredibly popular. But the industry was leaning more and more towards cheaper and cheaper printers so that 3D printing could gain a more broad audience and more people would be buying things, more people would be making things, and $10,000 was still a bit high for most people. Like the real goal is to get something like under 500. Like if someone could build a 3D printer for under 500, you would just like, you'd have it. Later, MakerBot's first commercial kit was made in, in 2009, and it was based off of the RepRap project. And as of now, things are only getting better. I mean, my 3D printer was $300. It was a kit, and it's based on the RepRap project. But there's other pre-made printers, like obviously MakerBot is still a thing, but now we have more ones like Ultimaker that make more, I guess, high-end consumer 3D printers. And then there's the M3D, which is like the cheapest available 3D printer, pretty much. The cheapest ready-to-print printer, and it's like 300 bucks, I think. But things probably... I don't know if prices can actually get any lower, but right now I think they're at a point where they're getting really good for the price. So, with the history of 3D printing out of the way, now I'll let you know what the 3D prints are actually made of. And you can see here all of these different acronyms, PLA, AVS, nylon, well nylon's not an acronym, but there are a variety of different materials that 3D printers can use. And primarily for FDM printers, like RepRaps, MakerBots, Ultimakers, and my printer, I use PLA which is polylactic acid. It's a plastic. You can see it there on the spools. It's rather cheap. It's only $25 per kilogram, and a kilogram is one of those huge rolls. And ABS is like the second most popular material. It has a higher melting point, but it has better mechanical characteristics, and nylon is even better. But all these other materials are a bit more fancy. A lot of people do print with these, but I won't be getting into detail with those because I don't have experience with those. But as for the cost of 3D printing, you can take a look at this. These, all of these pieces are printed on my 3D printer with PLA. And as you notice, it's like very cheap. That big dragon statue, which is almost solid, is only like a buck 60. And it's really detailed, rather large. It's like probably about four inches tall, has a very big base, uses a, a bit of material. But all of these really high detail High quality 3D prints are created for very cheap, and all of these things here are just like five bucks. That's like a fifth of a roll of the filament that I use. And the cost benefits of 3D printing are really, really good when it comes to FDM 3D printers because the material is just so cheap. Now, here's the business end of the 3D printer it's the extruder. Now, this is again only for FDM printers. And it basically just deposits molten plastic with a motor and it feeds it uses the motor to feed filament through a heated element i'm not sure if you can see it on the diagram but there's a little metal block behind the fan and behind the filament and that has a little toothed gear on it that sort of mushes into the plastic filament and it feeds it down through the heated nozzle which is that silver metal block with the brass tip and Normally the diameter of this nozzle is 0.4 millimeters, which is, I don't know, I can't think of anything to compare 0.4 millimeters to, but it's like, you know, about half a millimeter. But other nozzles go a lot lower. I've been experimenting with 0.2 millimeters, and it does help with the resolution a lot. But generally, you're dealing with 0.4 millimeter nozzles. And I like to think of these like a hot glue gun. Just computer-controlled hot glue gun that lays down plastic onto whatever you're printing on. So the extruder, it feeds it down through, you see in this animation. The movement has three axes, X, Y, and Z. And then there's also like a fourth axis, which is the extruder, because it just treats all of these motors as axes. And it basically just says, go to this coordinate, and between these two points, lay down this much plastic. And that's how it works. So you have your X axis, your Y axis, and your Z axis. And if you combine all of those together along with your extruder, you get a machine that can draw paths of plastic onto a 3D print bed and onto previous layers that it printed. And this is how 3D printers typically make 3D objects from a roll of plastic and a heated nozzle 
and motors that control where the extruder nozzle is. So for 3D printing, there is a bit of a workflow to it. This is how I do it. So you start out with a 3D model, either from commonly Thingiverse, which is a good resource for it, or designed yourself, which is, I like to use AutoCAD to design mine, but other people use different programs that are a bit more organic than AutoCAD. But you get your 3D model, and then you put it into a slicer. Now what the slicer does, it does kind of what you think it does. It slices the object into layers. But not only does it do that, it puts the 3D model into machine code. And you can see it there, it basically just has commands that tell the extruder and the printer where to put the nozzle and how much to move each axis and what speed. And this is what the printer reads. The printer doesn't really read a 3D model, it reads G-code is what it's known as. And then this code goes onto usually an SD card or directly to the printer, which then uses filament to create the finished object. So what can 3D printers do? Well, right now, um, the really, really high-end 3D printers are used in medical applications a lot. Like they've been printing a lot of like skull cranial implants and also prosthetics because it's actually a lot cheaper to 3D print these and it's a lot more easy to 3D print these because you can print them to any shape you want and you don't need to like go off of a template or anything or hand make this. It's like you just 3D model it, you put it in the thing, maybe finish it up a little bit and then you have a working object. Now the printer that I like that I'm showing you here is one by MIT. It's the Many Materials Printer and it's an example of a high-tech 3D printer. It can print in, like, I forget, like nine different materials, probably more. And it can print really, really complex, intricate, and detailed objects that are really, like, you can basically just create almost anything, it seems, with 3D printers nowadays. But as far as the future, like, things are just going to keep getting more high quality. Things are going to be getting faster. And the quality and speed of 3D printers is really why these high-end 3D printers can be successful because they can create very good objects very quickly and that's like, you know, really good. So as far as the future, it's really hard to tell where this is all going. The 3D printing industry sort of just seems to have exploded, but things are definitely going to get cheaper, more high resolution, and I'm almost certain that like many people will have 3D printers in their home because it's like I've had one and they're rather useful, surprisingly. If you know how to 3D model, they're a really nice thing to have. So yeah, thanks for watching. I hope you learned a lot. If you have questions, feel free to ask me in the description. No, you don't ask me in the description. Ask me in the comments. Read the description if you want to see the source for most of my information here and like read up on it a bit more because the history of 3D printing is kind of interesting. But remember, if you have any questions, feel free to leave it in the comments. Consider subscribing, it helps me out a lot. But overall, yeah, this has been me, Laserwood10, talking about 3D printers. In the next episode, I'll probably take a tour of my 3D printer setup, so stay tuned for that. Alright, see you next time.